Good evening, and thanks for joining tonight's TI Technology webinar hosted by Texas Instruments. We're, tonight, we're going to take a look into the science and math behind helmet design. My name is Mike Houston, and I'm the moderator for this event. I teach algebra and calculus near Pittsburgh, where I use TI technology to make tough to teach, tough to learn concepts accessible to all my students. Tonight, we're really lucky to be joined by our two panelists, Linda Antonone and Stacey Thibodeau. For 34 years, Linda has taught mathematics and science to a diverse population of students at urban schools in both Texas and Ohio. She is the mathematics department chair at Pasco High School in Fort Worth, where she teaches pre-calculus, AP calculus, and AP physics. She holds a bachelor's degree in math and physics education and a master's degree in mathematics from The Ohio State University. Her passions are helping all students excel and making connections between mathematics and science using technology. Linda, thanks so much for joining us tonight. I'm excited to be here. And Stacy holds a bachelor's degree in biology and chemistry and a master's degree in educational leadership from the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. She has been in the science classroom for 17 years. She currently teaches at Southside High School in Youngsville, Louisiana, where she teaches all levels of Biology One. She has also taught biomedical science courses in Project Lead the Way program, as well as Chemistry One, Chemistry Two, and AP Chemistry. She uses TI technology to assist her teaching, data collection, and modeling math concepts, linking them to science content. Stacy, thanks for being with us tonight. Thanks, Mike. Glad to be here. We're expecting a large crowd, so your audio is muted. Feel free at any time to send any questions to Stacy or Linda using the Q&A window on the right side of your screen. We'll also be using the chat window to send general messages. As a reminder, this session is being recorded, and we'll provide a link to the certificate of attendance as well as a link for the documents that are being used tonight at the conclusion of the webinar. We hope you don't have any audio issues tonight, but in the event that you do, try selecting Communicate from the very top of the WebEx menu and choose Audio Broadcast. At this point, Stacy is going to discuss our agenda. All right, so um, Mike kind of handled all the welcome introductions. Um, we do have the chat window open, um, like uh, you can see, and then if you want to kind of introduce where you're from or say some hellos, some shout outs, I think everybody's kind of getting back in the swing of things with Thanksgiving break. Um, we're going to focus on uh, concussions and helmet design tonight. So we're going to talk about what is a concussion and look at some data and statistics um, given from the CDC website about concussions and uh, the data on it. We're going to try to tie that into current NGSS standards. Um, whether you're an NGSS state or adopting new standards. And then we're going to look at a design of uh, possibly a new student design for a helmet to counteract some of these concussions. Thanks so much, Stacy. And Linda is going to discuss our expected outcomes. So our expected outcomes, uh, we're going to be investigating what materials reduce the impact of force on an object. Analyze, we're going to be analyzing data using a best fit line, um, modeling, and area under a curve. And we're going to look at practices, core ideas, and cross-cutting concepts contained in the Next Generation Science Standards three-dimensional learning model. Linda, thanks so much. Uh, Linda, you should have control. Feel free to share your screen. Okay. Okay, so a um, couple things. Um, one of them, you're going to have a handout, uh, as Mike says, and one of those is the student activity. And it talks about what a concussion is, um, and that's also referred to as a traumatic brain injury. And they're caused when a person receives a bump, jolt, or blow to the head. And um, it could be to the whole body, which causes the head to jerk, it, um, but the brain is protected by spinal fluid in the skull and that acts as a cushion between the brain and the skull. And if the head experiences a jolt, the brain can crash into the opposite side of the skull and that causes a brain injury. Um, 
so we're going to be looking at this and the data that we have um, we got from not that but the CDC um, and so we're going to look at several different sets of data from the CDC and there's lots of information on here um, that you can look at even heads up to brain injuries so they have a whole program um, that the CDC has worked on with trying to help um, coaches and different kinds of people become more aware of what we can do um, with brain injuries. Um, this is the data that we're looking at and you can see that it goes by um, years. I only chose the 5 to 14 and 15 to 24, but if you look at 0 to 4 years old, that there's a lot of concussions there where little kids are, are experiencing concussions or maybe they're going to the hospital more. So. Um, so we're going to start with just looking at some data, and this is a TI-inspired document. And the way that the activity was written, this first part was not included in the document, and students actually entered the data in. But to make things go a little faster on the webinar, I put the data in for us. So you can see, um, basically, it's from 2001 uh, to 2010. But the data goes in two-year increments. So this, where it says two, that's really from 2001 to 2002, and this is 2003 to 2004 is where the four is. And um, this shows the, the data about traumatic brain injuries, and it shows the rates of traumatic brain injuries related emergency visits. So they have to have like gone to get some medical attention by age group and it's per 100,000 in the U.S. population. So these numbers over here are per 100,000 people in the U.S. population. And so we're looking at the data and we want to see, do we see a trend? So from the data here, okay, we're going to add a data and statistics page on the next page. And I'm going to click on the years at the bottom. And then I have the two different age groups. So I'm going to look first at ages 5 to 14 and see what's happening. Do we see a trend? So if you look, it looks like it's going up in between years 6 and 8. Here it looks like it's pretty steady. But overall, there seems to be an upward trend. So we can have students analyze this by a couple different ways. One is if you go to the menu and in the analyze, I like to use a movable line or have students find their own equation first, either plot a function or in this case use a movable line is really nice. And have the students try to figure out what is the best, where is the best fitting line. And so if they move their cursor to the outside part of the line, they can grab it and adjust the slope. And if they move to the center, they can move it up and down to try to think about, and I like it when students have to figure out and think, like, where do I think the best fitting line is? It's kind of like in the old days when I first started teaching, we'd lay a piece of spaghetti down on the graph and have kids try to figure out, like, where they thought the line was. But once students do that, I want them to be able to look at their line and then maybe compare it to the best fitting line. And so we can go in the menu under Analyze, and we can also get a regression. Now, I'm big on having kids get their own lines first, and if I'm teaching Algebra 1, my view is I don't do a regression right away because I want the students to understand what's happening. But if I'm teaching my AP Physics class, then I figure they know what a line is. Hopefully, they understand slope and y-intercept. So in those cases, sometimes I want them to find the regression. So now I can look at the line that I chose is the, this one right here, and the best fitting line is a little off from mine, okay? But I think it's good practice to have kids try to develop their own. So now we can look at what's happening to the slope. So this is for kids um, ages 5 to 14. It's both males and females. If I change this over here on the left-hand side and look at older people, 
So this is age is 15 to 24. And remember, there is data from zero to four. I focused on the ages where most of our students would be, because I thought that would be more relevant to them. But you can also look at older people and adults as well. Okay, so now what happened is when I changed this, the regression line changed automatically to fit this data. And so I might have to, you know, change my best fitting line as well, or maybe I'll just move that off, like out of the way and just look at the regression line. Okay, so if you look at this data, what happened? It went up, kind of went down, and then it's, so it took a dip right here from 2004 to 2006, um, but then kind of came back up to where it was and is going up again. So we still see a positive trend. And I think this is one of the things that's important for students to see. A lot of times when they look at things in their textbooks, they see everything is always going at a fairly constant rate, and they think when they're modeling something with a line that that's what's happening, when in fact, data's messy, okay? In the real world, it's not, it's not all so easy. So this is one of the things that I want them to look at and say, okay, I can see that the data is increasing. Um, the next part of the activity actually looks at different kinds of sports and um, different age groups to see where are students getting concussions the most from athletics. Um, so if we look at the next part, and this is all data from the CDC website as well, it's analyzing concussion data by age, sex, um, and sport. Okay, I guess we could put gender there if you want. Um, the following page shows the numbers of concussions as reported by emergency room visits by age and sport, and only the top five for each sport and age group are reported. So the other ones are all grouped under another category that says other, okay? So any space with a blank probably has injuries due to that cause, but it's reported in the other category because only the top five are reported for each age group. Um, Okay, so if you look, here's how it's organized. On the left-hand side, we see sports. And then this is males age 10 to 14 is the first set of numbers. Um, so the top five, what do I mean by the top five is I'm looking at males ages 10 to 14. So if you look, there's football, bicycling, basketball, baseball, skateboarding, okay? Now, there might be other things that cause the concussion, but those are the top five for men in that, or males in that age group, okay? So now as I move farther down, you can see um, there might be ATV, horseback riding, playground accidents, all these other kinds of things, but in that, and for males for this age, okay, these were the top five. When I look at 15 to 19 year old males, okay, I see football, bicycling, basketball, baseball and softball, and then skateboarding is not such a big one there, but ATV, that's the other one in that category. Okay, and then anything else, so that doesn't mean that there are not any in um, the other categories, but they're all grouped under others. So when we divide them up by category, it's only the top five that are reported as separated out. So when I look at females, there's nobody getting, or maybe very few, from football, but bicycling, basketball, and as we move down, we see soccer, horseback riding, playground accidents for 10 to 14 year olds, okay, and then there's other. And then the last category is females from age 15 to 19. Whoa, sorry about that. Go back up, okay, um, and I guess I can't see what's on the other side. We'll look at it with the other category, but you have to kind of arrow over and arrow back to see bicycling, where is that? That's not one of the top five. So if I arrow back, I can see basketball is number three, and baseball, softball, that's one, so you might have to arrow back and forth on this one so that you can see what all the categories are. So in category number six, which is pretty high, that's soccer for girls in that age group, 
and category number seven is gymnastics and cheerleading. So we can look at all these different categories. So now I want to be able to see graphically what does this all look like. So I'm going to go to the next page and I've added a data and statistics page and the INSPIRE has a way to look at categorical data. And so um, this is not linear data, and this is a big topic in middle school, not as much in high school, but it's still a good thing for students to be able to look at um, bar graphs and um, pie charts. So the first thing is I'm going to go down to the bottom and click here and add the sport. Okay. So here are all the sports that we're going to look at. And then I'm going to go to the menu and choose plot type. So the first thing I want to look at is a bar chart. So I'm going to choose the bar chart. So now all I've got is my sport at the bottom, but I haven't chosen anything on the side. Okay. So I have to choose what age group do I want to look at for all of these different sports. So I go to the menu. And under plot properties, I'm going to add the Y summary list. Okay, and this is all spelled out in the handout. Um, so if I want to look at females ages 10 to 14, I click here, and so only so I can look at it, and I can click on each one of these bars to see bicycling was about 12.2 percent, basketball is 11.1 percent, soccer 11. Horseback riding is 7, playground accidents is 6.2, and I could have some of these other things like softball, skateboarding, other kinds of things, and that all goes over here into other, okay? And then I can look at each of the different age groups, so I can look at females 15 to 19 and see how does that change. So now I see that soccer has moved up, okay, into I think the highest with basketball next. If I look at males, well, you probably know where most of them are coming for males, but let's just check it out. 10 to 14-year-olds, football is the highest with almost 21% of those traumatic brain injuries occurring in football at that age group. Bicycling is next, which is why they have these helmet laws for bicycles. Um, Basketball, baseball, softball, skateboarding, those are the top five for males in that age group. And if we look at football ages 15 to 19, so what do you think happens with football? Does it go up or down? Yeah, it's a lot higher now even. It's over 30% of those are from football. But we still have bicycling, basketball, baseball, softball. Soccer is not much. ATV is next. So not as many from soccer for the boys at all. It's not in the top five. And then, but soccer is probably over here in other along with skateboarding, horseback riding, and everything else. So this is one way to look at that data through a bar chart. But I might also want to look at it as a pie chart. So I can go to the menu and go to the plot type and change it to a pie chart. Whoops, sorry about that. Okay, let's try this again. Pie chart. So now I have that same group, but I'm looking at it from a pie chart perspective, which I sort of like a little bit better. I can hover over each of these sections and see the percentages, okay? So if you look at football, that's basically almost a third in this age group. I, if I want to see those all the time, I can go in the menu and under plot properties, I can show all the labels. So that, I, I think that's really nice because then I look at it and I see football is about 30.3, other is 38.7, and I can see basically what my top um, sports are as far as getting traumatic brain injuries um, for 15 to 19 year old males. Now, if I then I just click over here and I can change it, the labels stay on there, okay, and I can change it to females, 
and get some information there and go back over here. So what the activity does when you look at what the questions are for the students, okay, um, they're going through and analyzing the data and they're thinking about what does this mean, what do these numbers mean, they're entering the data here, and I like it that it's a little bit more open-ended. So on the second part, when they look at all these categories, um, and after they've looked at it all, the questions are more about analyze the data from the pie chart, which sports have the most concussions, does it vary by sex and age, write at least three summary statements that you can make from analyzing the categorical data. And that really opens it up, and so different students notice different things, and that's one of the things I like to do when I'm working with kids um, and trying to make connections with math and science and get them motivated is I want them to be able to analyze and figure something out for themselves. A lot of them want me to tell them, like, well, what should I be writing down? And I want them to be able to look at data and analyze it for themselves and realize that lots of different kids might say different things, and then we can share all those out and they get a lot more information. Um, if the director of the CDC asks you to make recommendations based on the data, what would you recommend? Write a paragraph to support your recommendations with the data. So this is the first part of the activity, is just analyzing all of the data and trying to think about what does this mean, um, what can we do with it? Okay, Mike, I haven't been, mod I have not been looking at the chat. Do I have questions? Um, I don't see anything uh, just yet. Um, I'll let you know. Okay, so Stacy, do you wanna talk about MGSS? Yeah, um, so <clears throat> as the, the science uh, sp special teacher, I don't teach math like Linda does as well. Um, I love the fact that you can do multiple graphs um, with Inspire, and so if you're joining us and you're not necessarily um, an avid user of Inspire or your students aren't, um, Linda's showing us the variety of the types of graphs. Um, I teach juniors, and so hopefully by the time they get to me, they know how to graph by hand. Um, but I always start with my students showing them how to graph by hand. Um, we are a one-to-one -one school, so we have Chromebooks, and so I show them how to graph on Excel um, and uh, using uh, Sheets. And then I show them how to use on on Inspire. And always, my students prefer how to use uh, the Inspire for graphing. They insert uh, the, whatever data they have collected, whether it was using a sensor or not, um, into the lesson spreadsheet and shoot it over data and statistics, and they can show me whatever data, however I ask for it. Um, so Linda's showing that in the, the variety and the way um, that you're able to show the difference um, just by clicking on the, um, the different um, uh, axes. To me, it, it shows um, that, that true connection between math and science right then and there. Um, I love that part that you're able to see all that. I love it too. Yeah. So I'm going to stop sharing, and then okay. you can share. Um, right. I'm going to move this. Could I move it to you? Yep. Okay. So I'm going to change. You are now the presenter, Stacy. Thank you. All right. So um, I teach uh, mostly uh, this year some biologies and chemistries, um, and Louisiana adopted uh, new standards this school year. Um, we are not an NGSS state. We are NGSS-ish, I say. Um, we took what other states have done and modified and aligned with NGSS um, and changed a lot in one year. Um, I feel for the math teachers when a lot of those districts went to Common Core or changed. Um, but I do think that the availability that we have with TI technology um, with the activities like the one Linda and I are showing tonight, what also is on the website um, that we'll talk about later, and then also with if you are a data collector, which we'll show in the activity, um, the availability of TI technology to pull in NGSS um, definitely works. So um, with NGSS, NGSS stands for the Next Generation Science Standards. 
Um, and like I said, I feel for my math counterparts who went through this a couple of years ago when everything changed. Um, NGS. Do you want to share your screen? Oh, I'm not shared? Okay. No. I thought I did it. Thank you. Now I am. There you go. Okay. So sorry about that, guys. Um, NGSS for science is the the way that we are able to tie into the love that students have for exploring um, and tie it into um, a standard that we're able to get them to achieve and or master. Um, the way we look at science now in the United States is that kids are coming to us knowing science. They explore it, they can see it, they can touch it, they can taste it, they can smell it. They come to us knowing something. Um, we just either have to tap into that and give them more skills um, or we have to maybe tweak and fix some of the content that they might not have um, mastered on their own. And so as a biology or a chemistry teacher, students are constantly outside, they're exploring the environment, I bring that into my classroom um, and then help explain it. So with NGSS, um, the, I look at NGSS um, as a table or a stool, right? And so the stool itself, there's always the part we sit on and it's supported by three legs. The three legs represent a three-dimensional standard. And the dimensions um, include a science and engineering practice. And so for my science teachers or people who um, have experience in science, that's the old sciences inquiry. What can we get the students to do to show us that they understand the science? Um, and so it's the doing of the content. And I'll talk a little bit about what this activity focuses on as the SCP. Um, the disciplinary core idea is the actual content. And so if you were following um, whatever standards from your district and there were, I don't know, in Louisiana we had, I had 35 content standards for biology last year, um, which is ridiculous. Um, but the disciplinary core ideas talk about the actual content, whereas the CCC to me um, is that stem. It's the mesh between what the math teachers are doing and I in turn take that and speak the same language they're doing um, and bring in those cross-cutting co concepts. Um, and then I know in math you guys have your mathematics practices and we can pull in the mathematics practices in our science and engineering practices as well as some cross-cutting concepts. Um, so like I said, I like to think of it as a stool or a table with three legs. The three legs have to support the student understanding of the standard and ultimately meeting of the standard. Um, if you're new to NGSS, all NGSS standards have a performance expectation. The performance expectation is just that. What can the student do to show me that he or she has mastered that content? Um, I actually post my performance expectations on my wall. Um, I don't do anchor charts like maybe some people do, but I post the performance expectation to be able to show the students this is where we're going. And every time we learn a skill, we master a skill, we master a content, I add it to my wall so they can see that road map of where we're going. Um, this is the first year for high school Louisiana to have a, our standardized test to be performance expectation um, uh, focused. I'm kind of nervous about that uh, for biology, um, but we'll see. We'll see how it goes. I'm excited. Um, finally, it's a performance base. It's not just memorizing some biology concepts or some chemistry concepts. Um, students should be able to be able to do things now. Um, one thing that um, is, is big with NGSS and certain authors who've um, spent a lot of time researching and um, promoting how to get there is called a gather, reasoning, or communicating. Um, if you're a visual learner, this is perfect because it's color coded and the colors are actually representing the science and engineering practice, the disciplinary core idea, or the cross-cutting concept. The color code helps. Um, and so those that are science, you see things like plan and carry out investigations. 
um, analyze data. Um, but maybe my math people see use mathematics as computational thinking and using that to explain and solve problems. Um, for us math and science teachers, I find my job as a science teacher is to support what my math teachers are doing. If you are teaching a concept, I should not be trying to reinvent the wheel. I should be focusing and bring that into my content to help and support. Um, so this activity um, that Linda and I are presenting does that. Um, Linda was showing you this is what the data shows. This is what is happening with our kids with sports. We, we want them to be active. We want them to play sports. We want them to be involved. But we need to do something. So at NGSS, we call this a phenomenon. It is going, this activity is phenomenon driven. The phenomenon is that unfortunately, we have these concussions. And like Linda mentioned, whether that we are now reporting more and seeing more incidences of people reporting to the um, walk-in clinics or emergency clinics or ERs, or if we're now more finding out that the students are having these because we know more, the issue is that there are more. And so where we would go with this is that we would have students then do some research. What are some main um, causes of concussions? Um, and obviously, what is a concussion? And then can we develop some type of a device that would prevent the amount of force that's exerted on the head due to this traumatic injury. Um, and so Linda and I are going to show you um, an activity that will use a veneer um, sensor and using the engineering design process to build a model or a prototype um, to actually maybe um, assist the head in um, supporting um, some of the, the blunt force trauma or the trauma from that concussion or injury. So are there, um, I, I was also not um, looking at chat. Are there any questions, um, Mike, that I need to ask or answer? Linda, anything? I don't see anything. Okay. Um, so I'll go ahead and stop sharing. You want to send it back to me? Yeah. I'm trying. Okay, just drag the little ball. Okay. Uh, there you go, Linda. Okay. I wasn't where I thought I was, but um, a couple of things that uh, I wanted to show you. Um, Betty Gasky sent this to us. There's a lot of information coming out about um, traumatic brain injuries and, you know, the disease CTE, if any of you saw concussion. This one is from Virginia Tech, and um, they have been doing, if you, I'll move down a little bit so you can see it, but since 2011, the Virginia Tech researchers have been providing a, an unbiased helmet rating that allows consumers to make informed decisions when purchasing helmets. And so they have different kinds of helmets and they rate them. And you can get information here and they talk about why do that and what do they mean and how are the ratings determined. Um, and here's updates. They have bike helmets. They have ratings for soccer headgear that have just been released. Um, and varsity uh, football helmet ratings have been updated. So there's getting to be a lot more information. So as Stacy says, students can research. Um, there's a lot of information out there. Uh, Boston University is doing some, a lot of information uh, and they just put out a study about concussions and looking at CTE, um, the disease that a lot of the football players are getting and basically some of what they've, they're saying and if you read the research is the CTE is not just from concussions um, and some people that get it don't have any concussions but it's just the repeated jerking of the head and the um, the brain hitting the the head from like repeated jerks, so you don't even have to have concussions to get that, which is interesting and not you know like we just keep learning more and more. So it's really a hot topic, as Stacy said. So it's really driving the ideas. Um, here's what we're looking at: we want students to be able to come up with some kind of helmet design. Now, when we develop the activity. Um, 
we try to figure out how could we have students come up with something. So first of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about the physics of what we're looking at. And then we'll talk about some possibilities for the helmet design and, and what we decided. Um, so first of all, helmets are important for reducing injuries. We know that. Um, so this is where students could discuss with their group um, what activities do people wear helmets for safety and, and why. And we're going to talk a little bit about physics. So Newton's first law states that an object at rest remains at rest and an object in motion continues with constant velocity unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. And the second law is F equals MA, where the net force, okay, that's the F, that's not just any F, it's the net force acting on the object, is equal to mass times the acceleration. And so all of this comes into play when we think about what's happening with um, helmets and injuries. Um, so the brain is surrounded by the spinal fluid, and so we're going to, what your groups, like I like to have my groups talk about how does this play, uh, how does this all come into play, um, and what if you get a blow to the head, how does a concussion occur? And so they can, as Stacy said, do some research about what is a concussion. One of the things that's important, and um, I'm not going to go through all of this. You're going to get these documents. Um, Mike's going to send out a link at the end, and you'll be able to get all of these documents and look at them. Um, but momentum is one of the things that's important. Um, that's the product of mass times velocity. And so here's what I've, I've got another little slide here that I want to talk about. So one of the things that I, I want you to think about, and this is one of the things I have my students do, is just jump in the classroom. So think about what happens when you jump, okay? And, whoa, um, what happens when you jump? And how, what do you do when you land? Okay, so I'm not monitoring the chat, but you can send your, you can send something in there if you want. But when you land, what do you do? You have to bend your knees. And what is the purpose of bending our knees? And what happens if you jump and you don't bend your knees? So if you want to put down your computer, you can try it. Um, but basically, when you bend your knees, what's happening? You're, you're coming to rest over a greater period of time. And if you jump and you don't bend your knees, then boom, you're coming to rest very suddenly. And you really feel a jolt through your whole body. And that's why when you look at... Um, when you watch movies and you see people jumping out of a window, they always land in something soft, okay? Um, a big trash bin or something like where they can come to rest a little bit more slowly. So if you look at this image right here and we look at the force over the interval of time and you think about what's happening if you drop something. Um, so if you drop something from a certain height it gets to a certain speed when it hits the ground, and then it has to come to rest. So that's like you jumping, okay? Well, if you come to rest suddenly, what's happening is this amount of time right here, okay, between T1 and T2 gets really short, and the force goes up a lot higher, okay? Because this impulse, which is force times the change in time, is equal to the change in momentum. But if you can extend that time more so that something comes to rest a little bit more slowly, then what happens is the force goes down, okay, because you still have the same change in momentum, but it's basically an area model here. So you can bring in a little calculus if you're a calculus teacher, um, and you can think about the area under the curve here, this blue, light blue shaded area. Okay, that's the change in momentum, and that's going to stay the same if you're dropping from a certain height or if, if you're going from one speed to zero, okay? That change in momentum or the area is going to be the same. But if you can extend the time out farther, then what happens? Then the force is going to drop down, okay? So that's one of the things that we're looking at in the helmet design is how, how does that work? So I'm going to come back to... Um, looking at this, and so the momentum is the product of mass times velocity. 
So I have my kids talk in groups about what this is, and the impulse is the product of the force times the change in time during which it acts. And those two things are equal to each other. So I'm going to move through here. So here's the design part. In the activity, you have to create a cushion to simulate the head protection using only the materials provided. And I think in this other one, in the NGSS, over where Stacy was, we have some. Okay, so here's some examples of what you might provide. Okay, so you could provide bubble wrap, rubber bands, pipe cleaners, cotton, other kinds of, you know, just lots of just different kinds of materials is what we try to provide. Um, when we looked at how to do the activity, and we thought of lots of different options, and we contacted Vernier to see what they thought as well. Um, and what we decided was the best thing to do would be maybe use a racquetball and a force sensor. And Vernier had all these kinds of um, different options, like, well, you could do this and you could do this. And then I went around and asked math teachers in my department if they would ever try to, like, make all of those different things. And they looked at me like I was crazy. Um, so we decided to try to make it something that was a little bit easier. And then if you're really into it or you're teaching an engineering design class and you want to do more, you can do that. But we decided that when we wrote this, we would make it the basic idea. So you do need a vernier force sensor, and it comes with either a hook or you have this little knob that you can put on the end, okay? And you can either connect it with um, a lab cradle to your Inspire, or you can use an easy link. So you don't need the lab cradle, you can use the easy link from Vernier. And you connect that to your Inspire. And what we decided, and I've got a little video to show you, um, Cassie Whitecott, and Cassie helped us with this, but her son was in a program tonight, so she did not get to do the webinar, um, but she made the video here. So. What we want to do if we're going to look at this is have a certain height where we drop from a certain height and we're going to drop it onto the force sensor. So we've got just the racquetball here. I'm going to show you the video. So you're starting at this certain height, and if you want to be able to collect data and see the impact of your um, helmet, you want to always start from the same height. So I'm going to go ahead and press play. and. I'm going to drop it, and so it drops right onto the sensor, and the sensor is going to read the amount of force as a function of time. And so I have some sample data here. Um, hold on, not there, over here. Okay, there it is. Okay. So what we see, here's our, um, I think I said everything back here. It tells you how in the activity and in the document that we're going to send you, it tells you everything that you have to use and how to set it up, okay? And then you're going to drop it. You, th these are things that you can zero. You can reverse the readings. So um, you get a nice graph here that shows here's the maximum force. So what is it that we want to be able to do? This area under the curve right here, that's the change in momentum. So if you want to reduce this force, this area here is always going to be the same. And so what you want to be able to do is extend the time, okay, that it takes for this ball to come to rest. Okay, so instead of hitting it and like, you know, making this big force over this amount of time, Okay, if you can extend the time, then the value for this force is going to come down. So what you want to do is have students come up with different kinds of things and then drop the ball and see what happens. So um, if you, one more thing, I'm going to go back to this. When Cassie collected this, Cassie collected this data, and she collected it over, if you notice, this is from three point. She, she selected out a portion of the data right here so she could look at it a little bit better because the data occurs very quickly. So you might want to use the select features of the calculator to select out just a certain region and basically just trace to the highest value here, okay? You can also use the features of the calculator to figure out under analyze 
um, statistics on the fourth, and you can find the maximum that way too. So you can tell that the maximum was right here. So you can trace to it or you can use this kind of data, okay? If you want, you can even find the area under the curve and figure out what that's gonna be all the time by doing an integral. Okay, um, I might wanna just fade from here to here. I probably should do that. I'm gonna control Z. I'm gonna just select this region right here and do the integral right there. And that area under the curve. Now, if you're not teaching a calculus-based course, you can still talk about area. And I just call this an area finder. If I'm not teaching calculus, you don't have to say that. But basically, this area should be about the same all the time um, under here, but if you're dropping from the same height. But then you want the time to be greater and the force to drop. Okay, so that's called striking the data. So then you're gonna analyze the data, okay, and talk about all of that. And then, so basically you can have different designs and it, depending on what you wanna do, you can have kids talk about different kinds of sports that they wanna develop a helmet for and why they might develop it and how some sports might need more padding at certain areas than others. Like football would be different from soccer you know, should basketball have any kind of headgear? And if so, what would that look like? So the nice thing about this kind of an idea, I think is it opens up lots of creativity for your students to start thinking about their own ideas. And if you just wanna do a simple helmet design, this could be it. If you teach an engineering course and you wanna get into it a little bit more, you could do that and even contact Vernier and talk to them about some options for um, maybe even other ways to do it. And I think, Stacy, you said you had some ideas um, that you, you talked about for a, from a class that you took, right? Yeah, so like kind of tying this all back to NGSS, um, where we are right now is I we would have the students present their design based on their data. So one big thing in NGSS is to argue with evidence. Um, our ELA counterparts love that part because they're going to use the information from the text to argue whatever point they're trying to make. Well, we as science math teachers would have our students argue why their design is best to either prevent or have less concussions for the sport they're trying to build their helmet for based on the data they collected. Um, and so you want to talk about making a student ownership of their own information, ownership of their data, ownership of their design. Um, that's a huge science and engineering practice. Um, another thing that, that with the data like Linda is showing right now is that's mathematical modeling for us in science. Um, I, I don't teach the mathematics concepts, but I know the mathematics concepts. And like I said earlier, I can apply what my math counterpart teacher is 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 talking and we talking we're talking the same language um, so when they leave math class they have the same content here um, and another uh, thing that what Linda was hinting to is that um, I am um, project lead the way trained as far as biomedical sciences and I went to a training um, several years ago and it just so happened that the engineering teachers were there at the same time and we had a group of engineering teachers in the lobby with us. Uh, they were working on their end of the year projects. We were working on ours. And it was designing a helmet. And um, the gentlemen that were in the lobby were trying to think of something similar to a Tide Pod um, that would pop with a certain amount of force that was exerted, um, but not be tied because we don't want Tide running in our football player's eyes. But were there biological materials or materials that were less uh, corrosive or detrimental to the human body, um, but still the same design. And they were using true, real football helmets um, and applying padding, and they had different sensors than the veneer sensors, but they were still applying the same forces um, that would be exerted on a football player. Um, if you, I saw a few people in the chat window were discussing concussions on their campuses. Um, and Linda mentioned it earlier. I don't know if more people are reporting it. We now know more, um, but it's huge. Um, I teach juniors, and 
I have several juniors that ha are on little small modified plans under their concussion protocol. Um, they have trouble spelling. They have trouble um, articulating words. They have trouble with math um, just from playing their favorite sport. Um, and so if you bring those kinds of conversations into the classroom, the real world, um, then the, the kids are more apt to buy into whatever math concepts you're teaching, whether it's um, calculus, whether it's the physics concepts, it's um, an engineering design concept, where data collecting in a STEM class or um, uh, an engineering type class. Um, and NGSS allows for us in science um, to, to feed into those students. Um, so I, I mean, I, ho I hope that you, any, anybody who's watching tonight actually um, realize obviously the severity of concussions and the reporting of concussions, but that we can make our students ownership of the fact that maybe their best friend who plays football got a concussion and they can come up with a solution um, applying math, applying science, applying science, STEM um, concepts to actually fix these real world problems. Yeah, and I was going to, I'm looking at the chat, so I'm going to add a couple things. One, yeah, my daughter had a serious concussion two years ago playing soccer. She was out for five months. We were at the uh, Ben Hogan Center of the hospital three days a week for 10 weeks, um, and she could not, yeah, it, it's pretty serious. She could not, like, hear loud music. She couldn't sing in choir. We couldn't go to church. She couldn't be in the passing period between classes, and different kids have different effects, but it took five months for her to kind of get over it, and then she had migraines the whole next year. She's really still having some headache problems even a couple years later. Um, so it's pretty, I told her she was not playing soccer anymore, and she doesn't. Uh, there was a question about why the impulse is the same. Um, so if you drop from the same height, so I wanna say something about that. If I drop from the same height, then by the time the ball or whatever it is that we're dropping gets to this height right here, it has the same velocity. So if we drop at initial velocity of zero here, um, either through physics equations or conservation of energy, you get to this point right here where it touches the probe and um, the, the velocity is going to be the same. So it has to go from that velocity to zero when it touches the sensor. Okay, and that change in momentum going from that mass times velocity that it has at the end of the ruler to zero is always going to be the same because it's, that's what it's got to do. It's got to go from whatever velocity it has to stopping. Um, if it's going to bounce off of here and turn around, it has to stop first. So that's always the same. So that's the impulse, the change in momentum, which is also the force times the change in time. And so... Where's my other picture? Um, so that's why this force times the change in time and the change in momentum are the same. So this is a constant, and we reduce the force by increasing the time right here. So that was one of the questions that I saw in the chat that I wanted to check on. Um, and I think we're getting close to out of time, but just um, wanted to reinforce a lot of what Stacy's saying. I think kids are a lot more motivated when they see something that they're interested in that's impacting them. There's a lot of research that kids can do. The data that we put out here was from the CDC. We have to be very careful being Texas Instruments to use data that's um, um, on a public site like that, but your students can probably find lots of other studies where they can actually look at some other data to analyze as well as the data that we're providing. So. Um, anything else you think, Stacy? I'm going to stop sharing, Mike, and go back to you. Thanks so much, Linda. So uh, I just want to add to that and piggyback off uh, what you were just saying, uh, and that is um, I, I agree with everything you just said, but th th this activity uh, can really take a, lots of different directions. Um, so if you're a middle grades teacher, uh, I think you could find value in it. And if you're a calculus teacher, you could find value in it um, compared to, you know, whatever science you may or may not be teaching. So I, I just thought uh, 
that there was, as I was watching this activity, that there was a lot of different things that I could present to my students, even if it was part of the activity and ask them to do certain things, not necessarily um, that there was a, a specific, you know, beginning, middle, and end that my students had to get to. So I just wanted to throw that in there. Exactly, and that's that's the one thing that I would say too. You know, teaching my AP Physics class, I might do parts of the activity, but not the whole, you know, some of the activity I wouldn't do. So, you're right. Thanks. Uh, so as we're wrapping things up tonight, if you do have any last minute questions for Stacy or Linda, uh, please try to get those asked. I know they'll do their best to get those questions answered. We're excited that the T-Cube International Conference is coming uh, to Baltimore this year in early March. Um, it really is a great place to uh, connect people like Stacy, like Linda, like Cassie, who uh, again, unfortunately, couldn't be with us tonight. Um, get to know them. Uh, get your hands on, say, some of these probes. Uh, maybe you've never used a, a force sensor, uh, and I, I would bet that there's going to be uh, some sessions at the, at the conference that are going to deal uh, using probes like force sensors uh, where you might actually get the chance to do an activity like this. Um, so please feel free to visit our website to learn a little more information about the, the conference. But again, it is coming to uh, Baltimore in early March this year. We're also currently running an extra credit contest. Uh, this is a contest where teachers um, can earn uh, entries for doing things you probably already do on a regular basis in your, in your classroom. Um, and whenever you visit TIExtraCredit.com, you can learn more and sign up. Um, doing things like what you're doing tonight, like attending a webinar, uh, will earn entries. And uh, the more entries you get, the better chance you have at winning uh, some prizes. Uh, tonight's entry uh, code for the webinar tonight is heads up. It's not case sensitive. It is one word. And I'm putting that in the chat window, heads up is the specific code for tonight's webinar. Again, feel free to visit TIExtraCredit.com to learn more. To receive a certificate of attendance, go ahead and click the link in the chat window. Also listed is a link for the documents that were used tonight by Stacy and Linda. If these aren't working for you for any reason, uh, just keep a look out in your email in a couple days. You'll automatically receive a follow-up email. And that follow-up email will be a link to the certificate, a link to the documents, and a link to the recording as well. And if you're watching this on demand, go ahead and copy that link into your favorite browser to receive your certificates. After the webinar, if you're in need of any post-webinar follow-up, you have any additional questions, uh, feel free to give us a call at 1-800-TI-CARES or send us an email at ti-cares at ti.com. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks so much, Linda and Stacy, and especially to Stacy uh, for helping out uh, and taking uh, Cassie's spot last minute. So uh, thanks to both of you ladies for everything you shared tonight. We really appreciate it. And thanks, everyone, for joining us, and we hope to see you back online next week. Have a great night.